The reading is from Luke 14, 1 to 6. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on a Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. This is the word of the Lord. It particularly interests me that Jesus healed a man with edema on the Sabbath. Let me explain why. This passage from Luke's Gospel calls the condition dropsy, which is an old-fashioned description for fluid retention and swelling, often in the legs or arms. One of the causes of this condition is heart failure. And what interests me is that this entire story is about failure of the heart. But it's the man with dropsy who gets his heart healed, while the lawyers and Pharisees come out at the end with unhealed hearts. There is a large corpus of stories of Jesus healing on the Sabbath in the Gospels, but this is the third and final time in Luke's Gospel that Jesus breaks the Sabbath law. Earlier in the Gospel, he heals a man with a withered hand in the synagogue. And he also plucks and eats wheat on the Sabbath, possibly the earliest recorded microaggression in history. In that earlier story, the one where Jesus heals the man with the withered hand in the synagogue, Luke records the Pharisees and teachers of the law as being furious. And so out of the public eye and in private, eating a meal in the house of a prominent Pharisee, you can feel the tension in the air. There are no more adoring crowds holding everyone accountable. Jesus is in the eagle's nest, alone, unsupported, and a trap has been set. In the authorised version, it says, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. I strongly suspect that the authorities had planted this man as a test to see what Jesus would do. And it's a clever test. Again, let me explain why. There was a carve out in Jewish law called in Hebrew, piku ach nefesh, which dictated that saving a life overrides all other commandments, including Sabbath laws. And this was a well-established part of legal thinking. But what wasn't well-established was the definition of saving a life. And clearly the man with edema didn't have a life-threatening condition. He could have come back on Sunday to get healed. As the Pharisee said elsewhere to Jesus, there are six days on which you can heal, come back on one of those. But it's also complex because the definition of saving a life was debatable. This was a classic old fashioned trap for Jesus. Take a contentious issue, remain silent, see what he does, then get him. And so you can picture the scene, Jesus alone, a hostile crowd, a man with a serious condition, but not requiring Sabbath day healing. What will Jesus do? But first let me ask, what would you do? I personalise this question because the church is under scrutiny at the moment. It's under scrutiny about its response to sexual and gender minorities. And it boils down to exactly the same kind of argument Jesus was having with the religious authorities. There is a clear body of scripture that prohibits same-sex activity. It's there for all to read, but it's also debatable. You can argue about each and every one of those isolated texts. You can also set the debate within the arc of scripture. It's a nasty fight, and to me it's very similar to the one in our passage today. And the penetrating question coming from the mouth of Christ to us is the same. Is it lawful? To the Pharisees and lawyers around him, the question was, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? To the Church of England, to the Church Universal, the question is similar. 
Is it lawful to emancipate LGBTQ plus people or not? I've spoken to a lot of churches over the nearly 10 years since Lizzie died. I've been on the radio, I've been on TV, I've spoken at Synod fringe meetings, I've been in people's homes, I've been in churches, and I've been in cathedrals. I've even been abroad talking about this very question. And one of the things I'm almost always asked is this, where do you go, Nick, for your scriptural authority on inclusion? It's lovely what you do, people say, but what gives you the authority to do these things? And every time I'm asked this question, I go back to Luke 14 and I quote these words. Which of you who had a child or an ox that has fallen into a well would not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? Ten years ago this September, we had a child who fell into a well and we didn't even know she was there until it was too late. And I'll tell you what I tell all those churches I've spoken at. This must never happen again. I would rather break the law and save a life than cover myself in religious purity. I would rather be damned for the sake of my gay friends than spend one moment in the company of judgment. It took a tragedy to heal my heart. I pray it won't take any more tragedies to heal the heart of the church at large. And it's for precisely this reason that we are holding the Radical Love Conference here on the 14th of September. Not because I particularly need a bunch of planning meetings added to my diary, but because we have been marked out by tragedy. But we have also been set free by forgiveness, and I am compelled to share it. Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? Jesus broke the Sabbath law. Let me say that again, because if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, we are meant to be like Jesus. Jesus broke the law. And they were silent, and they were raging. But I won't be silent, and this church won't be silent. Jesus always put people first. Go and do likewise. Amen.